This week, we speak with Chris Ang from Vericode. In the news segment, we review what's coming out of RSAC 2020 and the AppSec invasion of the Sandbox innovation. Stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. With 84% of cyber attacks targeting the application layer, securing our software is more challenging than ever. Synopsys enables DevSecOps with a portfolio of industry-leading tools, including Coverity, Black Duck, and Seeker, to help you build secure, high-quality software faster. Synopsys is the leader in application security testing. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash synopsis to learn more. Nearly every business today relies on mobile applications, yet the vast majority do not adequately secure them. Once downloaded, mobile apps escape your control outside the secure network perimeter, thus making them easy targets for hackers. Enter GuardSquare. From the makers of ProGuard, GuardSquare integrates transparently and seamlessly into the development process, adding multiple layers of protection to Android and iOS applications, and effectively hardening apps against both on-device and off-device attacks. Request a demo today of GuardSquare at securityweekly.com forward slash Square. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome to Application Security Weekly. This is episode 97, recorded February 24th, 2020. I'm your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with Matt Alderman. Hey, uh, we're recording live from RSA conference. Like, come on, this is fun. I can throw to you with <laughs> eye contact. This is great. I know. Yeah. You know, we've never been together to record yeah. Application Security Weekly since we made the switch. So we're all sitting together going, wait, we, we, we're, we're like all sitting next to each other. Yeah, exactly. And we've got John, John Kinsella yeah. with us. So yeah, you're you not my it. Skype. Yeah. <laughs> it only took 97 episodes. <laughs> right. Only 97. <laughs> What the hell were we thinking? <laughs> Maybe this thing is going to catch on. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's right. And so this this uh, disembodied voice that we haven't introduced yet is Chris Ang, the Chief Research Officer at Vericode. He's a founding member of the Vericode team and responsible for all research initiatives, including applied research, product security, developer research, and Vericode labs. In addition to research, he consults with customers to advance their application security initiatives. Chris is a frequent speaker at industry conferences, and he serves on program committees for Black Hat USA and the Kaspersky Security Analyst Summit. Bloomberg, Fox Business, CBS, and other prominent media outlets have featured Chris in their coverage. Previously, Chris was technical director at Symantec, formerly at stake, and an engineer at the National Security Engine, uh, Agency. Hello, Chris, and thanks for joining us. Good to be here. <laughs> I will send you the short version of the bio next time. <laughs> you got all of your PR guys, right? Because they send you the whole thing, and then you're like, oh, we do, do we read the whole thing, or actually, don't we? But the funny thing is, I think that might actually be the short version, but it's, it, <laughs> oh, it looks shorter in print. Anyway, <laughs> good to be here. <laughs> Y'all well, are my first meeting yes. for RSA this year, so I'll kicking it off. It's officially started. Fantastic. Well, I think one of the things I loved about that bio is that you kind of gave it, it goes through sort of an evolution of Vericode as well as secure coding, static analysis, all the way up to Vericode Labs, which I think, at least to me, is one of the, one of the newer things. So yeah, well, what, what can we expect from that? That's true. It's, um, so Vericode Labs, uh, Security Labs, is uh, sort of the rebranding of a company that we just acquired recently called Hunter2. And if you think about how we've been training developers over the years, uh, or not training developers over the years, a lot of it has been very CBT focused, a lot of you know, slideware, log onto a thing, take a 60 minute course with a couple questions at the end and you passed. And then like you never think about it again until the next year comes around and someone says, oh, you, you better go take a, a class again, right? And so that's not a good way for concepts to stick. Um, <laughs> we're not constantly practicing it. And so uh, Hunter 2, um, which is now Veracode Security Labs, is basically an interactive way for developers to learn about secure mm -hmm. coding. 
And so if you imagine an environment where you sign into a website and you've got a list of courses just like you would for CBT, but instead it's, it's interactive, it's spinning up a live environment, it's kind of stepping you through, well, here's what this attack looks like, um, here's what it looks like in the code. You know, you can exi- you're, it's, a, it's a running system. It's not like a, a simulation. Mm. And so you, know, you can do the wrong stuff. You can do the right stuff. You've got the guidance, and, the, and yeah. it kind of takes you through the, the various lessons. And um, you know, one thing I've noticed over the years, I'm sure you guys have too, is like when you show a developer what the attack looks like and how the, what it looks like from an attacker's point of view, like it just sticks way more, right? If you, if you show a developer what SQL injection looks like for the first time and they see credit cards theoretical. coming, yeah. right. Now they understand like why you're telling them to, you know, to parameterize their, their, their database query, right? right? Yeah. Whereas before that you couldn't really connect the dots. And so um, Security Labs is uh, a really great way to kind of to, to, to turn on those light bulbs for the developers and to give them like hands-on practice at doing this stuff in short bursts rather than multi-hour courses. So like it, it really kind of changes the way that security education works. Now, works. does it focus on like different languages or is it kind of generalized to any language? I mean, is it? So the, um, the courses would be specific to a certain uh, language or, you know, um, a technology stack, right? Because you're actually spinning up a live environment. You're going in there and you're, you're changing the code, right? So right. Uh, by its nature, you're, you're, you're on a certain tech stack. Um, but you can build courses, you can build modules for, for anything from the most generic thing down to very specific language framework, you know, stack. And so that makes it a lot more powerful. And so we think, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's, it's, um, it feels like it was a long time in the making. We've had a lot of conversations dating back to like even last year. But I remember actually when, um, when the company, I think first, uh, I don't know when they launched, when Hunter 2 launched, but I remember reading about it like on Twitter and it's like, oh, there's this cool new company that's doing uh, you know, developer education in an interactive format and they called it Hunter 2. And you know, for anyone who's not familiar with you know, the old, the, you know, the, the IRC memes, it was just like, it's very clever. It's like, it was like, I can't believe they actually named it that. That's so cool. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, not, every, not everybody gets that. That wasn't in security. So um, I think that's part of the reason for, for renaming. <laughs> to labs, right? It's, yeah. That's that's what it is. Right. That is awesome. And I think, yeah, all they need now is a Professor Falcon character to uh, <laughs> right, introduce right. some of the content. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> who knows, who knows what will happen. But it changes the way that, that, that developer education is being done. I it think d- that's the important part. It does. And I think a lot of that is a philosophy I've seen out of Vericode, the idea of moving the security concepts to the, basically to where the developers are. Because you were just saying, the slide word, like, rather than bring the developers to read the OWASP top 10, this bullet right. point, this bullet point, like, well, if developers are in the IDE, why don't we bring those concepts to them? And you also manage that question from Matt about what about the code that they're actually writing in? So they can actually learn their own code and not just all of this other code that's irrelevant to them, even though, sure, it's SQL injection, cross-site scripting. Exactly. I mean, historically, you give developers kind of generic recommendations on how to fix a certain type of flaw. And then they're kind of on their own to go and figure out how to do that uh, themselves. And usually, nowadays, they just go to Stack Overflow. Right? <laughs> and they get some really bad code. And sometimes they get something that works. And sometimes they get something that works and makes the vulnerability worse, right? And yeah. so if you can have like really prescriptive guidance um, it, it, you know, this way, it, it helps a lot. And that's, yeah, as you said, like that's kind of the, the theme we've been going for. If you look back to the past, what would you do? You'd build an application and then right before you get ready to launch it or, or your release date, you'd have a pen test done. The pen test would take one or two weeks because that's you know that's right. how we that's how yep. we always scope them, yeah. and then the results would come back. The consultants would be gone by then, right? You do the readout, and then like maybe you'd fix some of the stuff, but most of it was a surprise, right? You were never at the beginning. You were never told like, well, here are the things you need to avoid. It was just kind of like surprise. Here's some logic flaws, and here's some cross site scripting, and uh, you go fix some of it. You didn't have any context, and so over the years, you know, not just us, but you know, the industry has started pushing these touch points further and further to the left. Why do you wait till the end? You should mm-hmm. be testing your right. builds. Yeah. Well, why should you just wait? Why should you wait until your builds? Why don't you do it in the CI process? Well, why don't you do it earlier than that? And then put it in the IDE and get immediate feedback. And then you know, the developer who introduced the problem is actually the one who fixes the problem. And hopefully you know, he or she is learning from that um, along the way. So um, we've, 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 we've focused on that for a while as we've, as we've tried to become 
um, more accessible to developers, more useful to developers. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we just you know, sort of put out there was is something called the pipeline scan. And that's so that that's the thing that sits in like your CI mm. um, tool set, right? So whenever, you know, somebody checks in something and the automated build kicks off and all the QA tests, well, why not run the security test as well and get that feedback? And so that goes along with the existing product that we had that sits in the IDE. It used to be called Greenlight and now it's called the IDE scan for sort of parallelism. And so that you're getting immediate feedback. You're not you're not, you don't have to remember to go scan it. You mm -hmm. just, it's just happening in the background. And uh, you know, your median you know, response time for that is like three seconds. So like it's just constantly giving you the developer feedback. Mm -hmm. And then it happens, it happens in CA, CI, you find more stuff that you wouldn't have found because multiple people's code is coming together, right? right. Yeah. So you find stuff there and then you fix some stuff. And then eventually you get to that, that policy scan at the end and you'll still find stuff, right? Because again, you're merging code from lots of different people, but mm -hmm. you're finding less because you fixed a lot of it earlier. And mm -hmm. so the more that we can move that stuff to the left, fix it faster and cheaper, um, the better and the, and the less the developers are pissed off. Yeah, and it's gotta be great to go, especially too, without immediate feedback, you actually are getting feedback to the person who committed the code, who's in the place to fix it, rather than right. like the security team reading the PDF, opening those Jira tickets, figuring out who to assign them to, so right. that you know that other one. And, and it doesn't even go to the original developer; it goes to like the sustaining engineering yeah, team, exactly. right? And they, yep. who has no idea how the code was necessarily written in that particular case, and I have to figure out how to fix this. That's bug. exactly right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, Verico is the first product company I've worked for. I mean, I've been there for like 14 years now. But early on, I remember when I realized like that the developer who introduced the vulnerability was was rarely the one who would fix it, and it was just like this, uh, like it's like you know, head explodes sort of moment. It was like, oh, that that's why like things. Right. You know, so we, we <laughs> wonder why we haven't, we haven't moved the needle very mm -hmm. far from a yeah. secure coding practice perspective because y you developed it, it got checked over here, and somebody else fixed it. So yeah. the, the original developer never learned the, the issue. Now and, yeah. that they get that visual feedback right away, it's way has w much more impact. In yeah, really changing the behavior and learning through that process. You have no feedback loop otherwise, right. and and a lot of companies obviously are still doing it that way, right? I mean, you 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 pretty much can talk to any company, and they are doing DevOps mm -hmm. or they are doing Agile to some degree, but you know a lot of times it's just like this little corner over there, and the rest of it still is, you know, like a waterfall mm -hmm. or or you know a sort of Agile like thing, and you have no feedback loop, and it's the same deal. So, um, you know, it's interesting. We we talk sometimes about how. DevOps is, is going to be a challenge for security teams, like the, how, how things are moving faster and you're releasing more often. But, you know, the, the, as we've been forced to adapt to that, we, we have a, you know, we've taken in one of those, one of those main tenets of DevOps, which is the, the necessary uh, right to left feedback loop. Yes. So just like they're doing that and improving their processes and the way they worked, that right to left feedback loop for security findings is there as well, and, and people are open to that. So DevSecOps can actually make it security easier if done right. It With can. that integration and that constant feedback loop, you can actually make security a lot easier in the DevOps pri pipeline if you, one, get the right tools, obviously, right. but also understand that there's a benefit of doing these checkpoints along the CI CD pipeline. Right, yeah, you can't take the old PDF report and the manually created yeah. Jira tickets and, and feed that into a DevOps process. So well, you, you no, do have to have no, the integration. It's better. No, no, no. Yeah. Here's your login to some security tool <laughs> over here. You go right. log into it up there and right. go pull down your own report. <laughs> right, exactly. That's, that, that's not integrated with anything else. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So it does give us, yeah, the opportunity to now, like, take this, this, this mindset and the, this, this approach and, uh, and plug into it in a much cleaner way. And that's something that wasn't really being done by, by security vendors five years ago. Right. And but, so talking about these like feedback loops to the sort of at a micro scale onto the developers, what have you seen on sort of the, the trends at more of the macro scale? Um, are there certain things that are developers still making the same mistakes for cross-site scripting? Are they making new and more interesting mistakes or? <laughs> What does that uh, look like? They're still making the same mistakes, okay. but but it gets better when you have that when you have the feedback loop because again, if you're being reminded about it every day, I mean, hopefully at some point you catch on, uh, as opposed to if you're being reminded about it every month, like it's just it's just too easy for knowledge to to slip away in that mm -hmm. that time frame, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, anecdotally, when you work with developers that are seeing it every day, I, I run product security at Veracode also, so my, my the team that I have that that works with the developing the development teams directly. Like they see, like oh yeah, well once once you explain it to them, sometimes you uh, you you 
you know, you show the attack, like I said, but if they're seeing it regularly and, you know, we're using the, the ID scan and the pipeline mm -hmm. scan and so on, it makes it easier. Like you, the context is there, right? You don't start from, um, you don't start from square one every time you, you go in and sit down with the developer, like more of the, the knowledge is already there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, more, more broadly, um, I think it, that the trend is, is for um, more security um, across, you know, so broader security, right? And not as deep as opposed to that, that single choke point that you might have had in the past, right? With the security team, the centralized security, it decentralization, yeah. it's pushing security knowledge and accountability, to be honest, to, to the teams. And, you know, there have to be a few things that are in place for that to actually work, right? The engineering teams actually do have to have the accountability. Mm -hmm. The developers have to know what they're being held accountable for just in the same way that they have to know, you know, that they're building the right functionality. Yep. It's not fair to say, well, you're going to be subject to a test at the end, but we're not going to tell you what's in it. Hmm. And then that's going to be tied to like, you know, your, your goals and your performance, right. right? And so making it more visible what they're accountable for, what the security requirements are, giving them the tools that are necessary to do that and not slow yeah. them down like that, sort of decentralization and so that you get to the point where you still have a security team, but you um, you only escalate to them certain things, right? You know that, okay, well, if I'm implementing something related to crypto, like maybe I should ch check with the security mm -hmm. team or if there's a new authentication flow, bring that up. Or if I'm integrating some other product, you know, bring that up. But for the, you know, the daily routine code reviews, you want to push most of that down to the team and train them to be able to do that. And that's, I think, the only way that that security really um, survives in a way that we want it to, right? right. So I'm yeah. curious, since you're doing that, then also a little bit of the product side um, over where you are now, are you seeing, what type of feedback are you getting from the developers? Are they saying like, hey, we want to see more of this type of security, either education, or are there certain areas where they're asking you guys more, more details for? Or? For the most part, developers are still not asking for more security mm. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I cross my fingers, never know. Yeah, maybe. yeah, but um, but when you make it easier for them, um, they're certainly like they're certainly grateful for that, right? As opposed to like, okay, go run your scan and come back to us if you have any questions, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Versus, here is um, here is the snippet that you can drop directly into your GitLab configuration, which will run um, a static scan. Right, Here, here's exactly where to put it, put it before this job and after this one, and, and it just works. And, and, you know, so products, you know, our product security team, like we have centralized security libraries that, that our developers use. We have the drop-ins for the various tool sets that they use, and we just point them to that. And so, uh, and then we help them debug when we hit edge cases or whatever. But for the most part, just making it easier, like making it like, hey, this is, we're asking you to scan on this, on this frequency, just drop in this code snippet. It really should only take you 15 minutes to do that. And, and they are thankful for that because then they can get the benefit of it mm -hmm. um, and then go on to their, to their, to their other work. So, right. so then here's one off that, that I've, I've had customers asking me. Once you have those tools available and even if you're giving them those snippets, how do you ensure that all the teams are actually doing the scan on that frequency? Yeah, well, you still have, like I mentioned before, like the policy scan. Yeah. So you still have mm -hmm. that that that. Whether you, you can make it a gate or you cannot, it just depends on what sort of organization you But you, you guys have. are still checking But you highlight. still have yeah. that. You still have the analytics that come back, right? So I can kind of see um, in the centralized view in our, in our platform, well, here are all the apps that are, that are part of, you know, Veracode. And um, if one hasn't, you know, scanned in the frequency that they're supposed to, that'll, that'll cause a fail and we'll see it. You know, you know and, and the product security team can, can look at that. So we still have visibility. I mean, the visibility is obviously still important, right? If you're a CISO, if you're a product security lead, you still need to know what's going on, but but you don't need to get in the middle of every transaction. You don't have to yeah. be the bottleneck. Right. And so that's the, the trade-off. And right? if that policy scan fails, you can fail the build and kind of force it back through the process if you need right. to. But you can it, you can do what you can do what you want with it. You have the tools to do that. But um, what 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 happens is they do find more stuff earlier. And they get to it, you know, they're not waiting till the end of the sprint or right. you know, whatever. They're, they're getting to it earlier. And so there are fewer surprises. Um, and you can actually go to develop, the, like, the development organization and say, like, all right, from this, from, from, from particular date forward, like, no new security debt, right? The idea that, you know, if you, fix, if you introduce flaws and then you say, well, I'll just fix those later, right? right, right. We know that doesn't actually happen. So you can actually say no more security debt. And so when they see those issues come up in their IDE or in their pipeline, like they know that the engineering leadership is behind mm -hmm. that, that security is a priority and 
um, they're not allowed to let that stuff pile up. So when you get to the policy scan, you find you just find a lot less that way because they're, they're fixing it early. Right. I mean, it's, it's great. Not without its challenges, of course. It's still, <laughs> it's still very difficult, but um, the, the tool sets make it easier. Mm. Yeah, definitely. No, I think speaking of challenges, the, I, I imagine that the tool sets at least make it easier to have that discussion about getting engineers to take on the accountability. Um, what have been some other ways that you've approached successfully, or even for that matter, some you know mistakes to avoid in the future of getting that buy-in from those engineering teams so you can actually decentralize and spread that accountability for security? Yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, rolling out a security champions or security ambassadors mm -hmm. type program where you're trying to decentralize that, a lot of times you're asking people to do more on top of their existing yeah, job responsibilities. Right. And so like, if you really want to get that working, you have to have an understanding with the engineering leadership that, okay, this work is actually important and they should allow that person, whoever they are, to, to, uh, to squeeze out 10% you know, of their, you know, even 5%, right, of their, of their weekly um, time to allocate to doing code reviews or to just making sure the integrations are working correctly or, or whatever the case is. If you don't have that, then basically you just turn someone's job from like 100% to 110% of their time without giving them anything back for it. Um, and so that, that was a hard lesson. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of identifying like who's going to play that role, you have a couple different choices, right? You have like the volunteering and the volunteering and like we kind of like the, the volunteering approach because you get someone that then either has an inherent interest in mm -hmm. security or they just, you know, they see that as a valuable, you know, skill set to learn. And, yeah. and so as opposed to a manager saying like, well, this is going to be your job to go yes. do this. We've seen uh, better adoption from, from people who's, who put their hands up, which seems kind of obvious, but, um, you know, you never know until you try it, right? Right. Um, just giving them access to, to additional training. Um, like now we can give them all um, Veracode Security Labs uh, accounts and they can mm -hmm. play with that as well. But before that, we would do a lot of CTFs in-house. Um, just the public ones, right? That people publish out there that oh, you can go fun. through and, and learn. You know, there's cross-site scripting game and it has like six levels and you know, all these other um, uh, CTF uh, type things out there where you can kind of teach the developers a little bit about the offensive side of things. And so we just have office hours where you can just come in, sit down, hook up your laptop and play on those. And, mm -hmm. and if you get stuck, you've got someone there from our team to help out. Um, so there's all these like little ways that we try to sneak learning in that are not sort of the formal training and you know, in the end, it, it helps them become more prepared. Well, if you make it fun, you gamify it, then you probably have a lot more yeah. interest in fun and interesting, and you're learning all at the same time. The nice, you mentioned gamify, like the, uh, the security labs thing, like there's, you, there's actually like a leaderboard, right? So mm -hmm. like, you know that for, <laughs> for our sorts of, of people, like that always helps, right? Mm -hmm. right. A little competitive aspect to it goes a long way. Yeah. Yep. So how much have uh, you seen people trying to hack the leaderboard and just short circuit that <laughs> way? <laughs> I don't know. I should, uh, I should, I should ask that question. You know, I, f I feel like if you can hack the leaderboard, then you deserve to be on top. <laughs> there's got to be something. <laughs> yeah. <true. There's> <laughs> I feel like you've earned it at that point. Right. Yeah, you want to get into the RSA stuff this yeah. year? I mean, obviously, we're at the world's largest security conference uh, this week. W kind of what's new? What should people expect when they go find Veracode? First of all, where's your booth? Uh, it's 5553, five, I think. I'm yes. glad you have the number. Okay, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Moscone North, booth number 5553. Five, five, but what will they see when they come over and see Veracode? It depends on which day they come and see us. But... <laughs> but um, uh, there may be dogs certain days. I, I heard there might that. be dogs there, yes. But uh, in general, so we're, we're now um, sort of just past the, the one-year mark of, of being an independent company again. And going along with that and just going along with all this, this development, um, this DevSecOps thing, uh, we've kind of done a little bit of a rebranding. And um, you'll see some fresh new colors. You'll see, um, you'll see a lot of the verbiage be, you know... Um, more, more, more positive than, you know, there's a lot of fear in there, right? There's a mm. lot of red and like padlocks and chains, like even still, like yeah. surprisingly, right? Yeah. Um, you'll see greens and blues and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see verbiage about like confidence. And that's really what we're trying to get at was, is the idea is like you've got a lot of developers out there solving problems, business problems. Um, we're, you know, we're basically running the world on software, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is give those developers the confidence to build that software securely without inhibiting what they're doing. And you'll see, so you'll see messaging around, around confidence 
and um, you know how application security, yeah, is a really difficult problem. It's you know it's not gone away for all these years, but we're trying to make it easier to do that with the tools that we have and the products that we have and the integrations and so on, so that developers can focus on building the products that matter for their companies, mm -hmm. and and do that in a confident way. And so you'll you'll see that we have a bunch of booth talks going on. So um, short you know short talks. Um, apparently there's going to be like you know, headphones so that you can actually hear the talks. Oh, uh, nice. you know, unlike yeah, uh, over we, the, we learned this. I know <laughs> over the din of the, of the, of the yes. conference hall. Uh, so it'll be broadcasting over speakers, uh, but also into people's headphones. So it won't, it'll be like kind of like silent disco sort of thing. But, um, so that's new for us. And there'll be a bunch of those talks throughout the, not just by Veracode people, but, but, but by, uh, other, other experts. And then if you stop by on Wednesday, uh, you can pet some dogs, uh, I guess, uh, apparently. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and maybe watch a talk at the same time. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on. You stop by and get your badge scanned. Uh, we're doing the thing where you donate. We're donating uh, a, couple, a couple bucks for each badge, badge scan to charity, cool. uh, which we like better than, than giving away um, a pen that you're nice. going to throw away. I mean, there'll probably yeah. still be pens too, but yeah, there but might be pens. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. thought it was really nice. So you're donating $2 for every visitor uh, to build on, uh, which promotes education, literacy in um, poor, poor parts yeah. of the world. We've been doing so. that for a few conferences now and uh, people seem to like it. And, and again, you're, you're not throwing away as much. I remember going to the AWS, uh, uh, not re re reinforced, reinforced the, the one that was in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they, I was just walking through the hallways and they had this clear kind of bin that just had a sign on it that said like, donate, like yeah. donate your swag here. And everyone's <laughs> like, you know, so you walk in the door, you get handed a bag and then you walk over to the thing and then you just put it directly in the, and then they donate it somewhere. But like, let's eliminate the middleman and just like just go straight to charity with the yeah, money. There so you go. So yeah, and uh, yeah, it'll be very bright. Uh, there'll be like the zero, the Veracode zero one, like right above the booth. And it's, it's visually, uh, very cool looking. So, stop by, pet some dogs. Pet some dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday is actually the l one of our. L today was probably the lightest, just because everybody's coming in today. Yeah. Um, and the uh, welcome reception opens in a little while, and then um, tomorrow's just like slam. Wednesday's yeah. actually a decent day. Uh, tomorrow's cra tomorrow's always the crazy. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. crazy day Everybody's Tuesday. like the doors are open. Look out! Everybody right. floods in. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because you have to be a certain badge level tonight to get into the welcome reception, so mm -hmm. not everybody's in. So tomorrow morning, every, all the Expo and Expo Plus badges are like all lined up, right. ready to go see the right. uh, the ex Expo Hall. So everyone's yeah. everyone's fresh. It's not yes. Thursday yet. We're all like <laughs> dragging. Right. Quite <laughs> said Larry eyed. Yep. 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 That we all because all the parties are Wednesday night, so yeah. everybody is just um, slow on Thursday as we <laughs> wrap up the expo hall. I, I think it was last year that I canned the phrase that I feel like a salmon swimming upstream, just trying to get anywhere on the expo hall. It's just like so crazy. And, yeah. Yeah. We'll come find you. I want to see the new colors. I, I I did put it for people. There's the new uh, <laughs> yes. new colors right there. The Char chartreuse like the chartreuse like yeah. color. Um, I yeah. put you right on the spot there with the, I know. With the sticker. Yeah, you did. And you, so came, I, and you came through. I came. I I, 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 I pulled it all together. Um, any other news or updates you want to provide us while you're here with us today? There's just a lot going on. I mean, things are uh, things are great at Veracode. I mean, the the growth rate is fantastic. I mean, signing new customers uh, left and right, picking up a lot in EMEA, uh, and even in the markets where we haven't uh, traditionally put a lot of focus Latin America and Asia mm -hmm. uh, seeing a lot of more activity there as well and you know I think um, it's a great time to be an app sec you know we're kind of outpacing the security uh, the, the market in terms of growth mm -hmm. um, I do want to see developers get better but uh, you know at the same time it's just like it, it, there's there's so much work to do right yeah and we uh, you know I feel like we're really in the right place we're, we're, we're resonating with the development community we're providing the right types of tools. We're, you know, we're, we're not, we're not kind of stuck back in the way that, that, you know, we used to do security, right, that as an industry. And so uh, it's, it's still, despite having been, you know, with Veracode now for, you know, 14 years, it's still an exciting place to be. Things are still changing. Obviously, there's new frameworks and languages all the oh, time, yeah. new attacks, you know, it never gets boring. So really excited about um, about where things are going. As software eats the world, there's a lot of code to get secured. There, there is a lot of code, yeah. and uh, it's not, you know, it's not going down. Every, every company is a software company, whether they realize it or not. Mm -hmm. And so, it's a good place to be. 
That's awesome. That's, That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. And we and love to see the fact that you're changing the tone of that conversation with developers too, bringing that collaboration, bringing that context uh, to them through the IDE, through the labs, through all this training. That's it has neat. to not be adversarial. It yes. has to, like, we have to get away from that. Yeah. Clearly it hasn't of... worked for 20 years. So <laughs> right. <laughs> let's, let's try, try something, something different. different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We have to, we have to like play nice together and, and, um, you know, make everyone's job easier. But like, you you know, I was reminding people like, you know, you're, you're not at, you're not really at odds. You're not, you know, security team, you're not fighting with development team, development team, you're not fighting with, like you all work for the same company, right? right. You're all, you know, your paycheck comes from the same place. You're trying to, you know, you're trying to push the right. company forward. And so you have to remember, like always assume best intent yes. there, even though sometimes it's hard. Absolutely. And we always, and we, we thank your intent for coming here and give, sharing us about Verico. That was some, uh, some great things that we've learned and some good things to look forward to at booth 5553. Five, 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 there we go. So that's how we'll find you and somewhere within the uh, sw swarms of uh, RSA. Yeah. <laughs> thanks well, again, chat with you guys. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Matt. Thanks, John. And um, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to return with the news of the week.